Welcome to WeRSC. Welcome to five things after Utah's 47-24 win against USC in the Pac-12 championship game. This is Eric McKinney, joined as always by Mark Culkin and Greg Katz. Uh, guys, let's get into it. Five things from USC's loss in, in the Pac-12 championship game. And, and the first thing, as always, we're going to go player of the game uh, in this one. And, and Greg, we'll start with you. Go ahead. Well, you know, I don't know how you pick a player of the game per se, given the final score. But to be honest with you, I thought it was Caleb Williams. I mean, in the first quarter, he was really moving it. And then he had his big run. He pulled up with a popped hamstring, uh, which we were not basically aware of at the moment. Uh, and I, I thought the remaining three quarters, he really played on guts and guile. I mean, he really showed character. He he was determined you know, you could almost say half of Caleb is better than most quarterbacks, you know, at 100%. So my my feeling was is that he showed a side of him that was not, quote, a pretty boy side. It was like, okay, they were coming after him. They knew once he was injured, I mean, he was, uh, you know, shark in water, the whole thing, blood. So he was my player of the game. And, and aside from that, and I'm sure Mark will touch on this, his statistics were – you know, if you didn't know he was hurt, you'd say, oh, he had a pretty good night. So Caleb yeah, Mark, is my guy. Mark, go ahead. You're player of the game from this one. Yeah. I, I mean, Greg touched on all the uh, um, Caleb, uh, big numbers, 363 yards, three touchdowns, an interception. Um, and he's playing on a really bad hamstring We'll talk about a little bit. Um, yeah, you, you give it to Caleb. He, he played on guts. He, he's playing on a bad one. But when you're playing, when when Caleb can't move to Caleb's abilities, um, I don't know if I agree with Greg that half a Caleb is better than you know, others uh, because that is so much a part of his game. In a pass rush like Utah was able to show, and he's unable to get him back. Um, I, 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 I think you give it to Caleb, player of the game for what he did under the circumstances. That's where I'll leave it. So if we're, if we're covering the game right from from a Utah and USC perspective, the the players of the game are on Utah's side. I think Jaquindon Jackson, the the running back, was phenomenal. Gabe Reed kind of the game of his life with, with a couple really significant sacks in that one. If we're looking at it just from a USC standpoint, yeah, it's Caleb Williams. And, and you try to sort of hunt, could it could it be someone else? Could you give it to a, a receiver maybe or or someone on defense? And there just really is nobody that played as as well uh well enough, you know, to to earn recognition. And and I thought what Caleb Williams did, what he played through how he played the the fact that he stayed out there yeah he he i think he deserves um a ton of praise from this one i i do want to sneak in kind of a maybe it's a, a five things plus half but but on the tail end of this because i think it's going to be it, it is such a massive part of this game and, and a talking point coming out of this one just a quick greg you're that coach. Would you have left him in at that point? Kind of, again, knowing now what we know afterward about when the injury occurred and the fact that it was a hamstring and how maybe the rest of the game would have played out. Do you leave him in or or do you pull him in favor of, of Miller Moss? Well, I think it was the right thing to do to ask him, how are you feeling? Do you feel you can continue to play? And uh, I think there was evidence that he was able to continue to play because he was moving the team in the fourth quarter. It's not his fault he can't make tackles. I mean, they, they got back in the game because SC did what they've always been doing this season, and that's missing tackles. They did it at the worst possible times, uh, I would say that. I don't think that uh, Riley would have left him in if he really felt he was so debilitated. I'm sure he would consulted with the trainers uh, and that sort of thing, and I think out of deference to... Caleb and what he meant to the team. Uh, I have a lot of people that have texted me that said, what in the world did he leave him in for? And I understand that perspective, but, you know, 
his health and his future is the most important thing. But obviously, it wasn't felt that that it that was in jeopardy at the time. And so I, I don't totally uh, buy in that they should have taken him out because uh, the grass always looks greener on the other side. And, and I think that uh, I don't don't think that uh, Miller Moss at that particular juncture what was going to make a difference. Caleb was making a difference. You know, how about somebody blocked for him? That might have made a difference. Mark, quick, quick to you. Pull him out, leave him in. Yeah, you know, we we heard Lincoln's answer after the game. Um, you know, he Caleb wouldn't let him take him out. And I know that's a lot of coach. There's, there's some coach speak involved there. And yes, I understand Greg's point he's making. Nevertheless, um, there was just when, when you're, when you, as I mentioned, when Caleb can't move, and this was coming straight up the middle. Yeah, I agree that the offensive line needs to block better. But at this point, you know whether or not Caleb needs to move outside of the pocket. He was he didn't even have enough time to move outside of the pocket. So I'm in the camp of, of you know what? I still remember Pete Carroll and J.D. Booty. I have a little bit of that flavor in the back of my mouth right now because it, if they were going to lose this game, lose this game, when they got close in the fourth quarter, it was kind of dangling there. Um, I don't know. It's it's a hard call. I understand why they didn't. You've got high Caleb Williams with the highest, but yeah, I I think you pull him and when you notice they cannot move anywhere close to the way he wanted to, and he just ends up taking shot after shot after shot of the game. Yeah, for for me, it was it was late, like when when it's out, and I know he. I mean, it was clear, it was clear that Caleb Williams wanted to be out there, and and he, not that he wanted to take those hits, but he he wanted to be the guy that was taking those hits. He he wanted it to be kind of on him, and and him to be kind of the, again, the captain goes down with the ship, right? Like he was going to be on the field for all the bad stuff that was coming, and and he was going to be that guy, and and that speaks to again what who. He is as a captain and a leader and why this team follows him, why he was able to come in and day one, everyone is in line behind him following his lead. And I think that speaks to his character. And I do think that he has done enough this year and Lincoln knows him well enough to hear him say, yeah, I can keep going. Yeah, I can keep going. I think it becomes something where, if it's going to be, Greg, you mentioned detrimental to his health long term, right? If he takes another hit, it could be disastrous. And so if you figure out that that's not in there, he still made he still made some Caleb Williams plays even at kind of the health level he was. There was a, a throw to Brendan Rice where he still sidesteps a guy in the pocket, stands there and, and delivers a strike. And Brendan's able to kind of take it upfield for, for some extra yards. It, it was kind of a clear statement. To me, we trust Caleb Williams' decision making and ability to kind of help the offensive line because that offensive line, maybe that offensive line is below fifty percent. I mean, when when Andrew Voorhees comes out and you have to shuffle guys around, you're getting hit at multiple spots now. And then I know Brett Nealon's injury came late, but still, when the game was, you know, they they still had a shot there um, at that point, and so. If, if Miller Moss is out there with all that stuff going around and Utah's defense was just all over the place, all over the place in terms of the rush, in terms of their, their, how they lined up, where they brought guys, what they did, that was a tough game for a quarterback. So I understand everything that went into Caleb Williams staying out there. And I'm, I'm completely avoiding the question of whether, whether I, whether I would have pulled him or whether he should have been pulled. I, I understand the way they did it and and the way that played out. I don't have a huge issue um, with the fact that he did leave him in there. And again, Caleb wanted to be in there. And, and I think that if you're going to fire your team up, you're going to keep the guys involved and, and all of that. Um, I think they did it. I, Mil, you know, Miller Moss doesn't give you the rushing ability that a hundred percent Caleb Williams does either. So maybe that, even if you go to him, you're still changing your game and, and USC just could not get, any sort of run game going up the middle against that Utah defense. So again, that I think that's going to be a discussion coming out of this one for, for quite a long time, but we're going to go to our second thing. I know it feels deeper than that in this, but second thing, and, and that's the play of the game. 
probably an idea where we're going with this one. But Greg, go ahead and, and start us off there. Well, strictly as a play of the game, uh, I don't think you could pick any other play than the one that Caleb Williams did in the first quarter in the 59-yard run. I, I mean, it was part fullback, part tailback, part slot receiver. I mean, he showed everything. And he took a big hit early on. And, of course, that we found out later that was the play that he that he hurt his hamstring on. And uh, as I was, Eric and I were watching on the replay, you could tell that he was he was starting to limp a little bit and giving it his all to get down there. But, you know, if you take the play that they show over and over against Notre Dame and then you see this play, you just go, boy, those are signature plays just to, on their own merit. And uh, that's why I think there's no question in mind. He's going to be the Heisman Trophy winner, uh, and deservedly so. Mark, your play of the game from this one. Yeah, obviously it's it's the, the one where he injures himself. But I'm going to actually choose a different – it's not so much a play as much as it was a series after. If you remember, Max Williams, he strips the ball, causes a fumble, USC gets it. They had the ball three times. They scored on three their first three possessions. It was 17 to three. They had a chance right here, right now, to put the dagger in. They ended up going forward on what? On, on, on fourth down. They gained two yards on the entire series. It was a wasted opportunity. And that was the momentum shift in the game. So it, it's not so much a play, but it was that particular moment where you went, uh oh. Things are going a little screwy right now. Yeah, and and if you want to go back further than that, you said they scored on their first three possessions. Not three touchdowns, though, right? Two touchdowns and then way in close, but couldn't quite do it on that third one and kicked a field goal. There, there was a lot of, for as poorly as the defensive played, there were a lot of things offensively where, and, and Lincoln Riley pointed to a few of them. He, he kind of, you know, poked the finger at himself, too. There were some plays offensively where we did not finish drives the way we should have. I'm going to go again, Greg. Yes. The, the Caleb Williams injury changes this, the potentially the playoff, all of that stuff, right? That, that was absolutely massive. That's the right call. Um, Mark went a different spot. I, I think there's one Utah scores right at the end of the first half. And, and in the first game between these two teams, Utah did a really good job in that middle eight. They scored right at the end of the first half, got the ball in the second half, scored again. That tied the game uh, ultimately. In this one, Utah, again, scores right at the end of the first half. They get the ball to start the third quarter, and USC does really well, right? They, they force a punt. They get the ball back. USC's going to go, no, they punt it back. It looks like USC is going to get a stop again. Makai Blackman on second and second and 19. He goes up, looks like he has a pick, can't come up with it. It forces a third and 19. That's fine. Get a stop here. Get the ball back. Utah doesn't go score, score at the end of the first half, beginning of the second half. No, third and 19, pass across the middle. Okay, it goes for 15 yards. Let's bring him down, force a punt. No, does not go for 15 yards. Goes for a 57-yard touchdown pass. And that it was a 17-17 game. Utah jumps ahead there, and that's it. That that's the road runner off into the distance. Uh, just a massive play, and and indicative, I think, of everything that kind of happened. Right, like you have a chance defensively to make a play, and you and you just don't do it. Whether it was the run, whether it was the pass, just not enough plays being made on on that side of the ball. The tackling there, bad. We saw it a few times, and and that was kind of throughout the game. I think that would just. That had a little bit of everything in this game. You had a chance to get momentum. You had a chance to tackle a guy short. You had a chance to then make another tackle later and, and chase him down and just couldn't get anything of it done. I, I think that was, outside of the Caleb Williams injury, kind of indicative of, of just everything that we saw um, in this game. We're going to go to our third thing now. That's the expectation you had coming into this one. That was met. I know none of us sat here and said, oh, yeah, it's going to be a 23 point Utah win. So so maybe we're searching a little bit on this one. But, Greg, go ahead. Your your expectation met in this one. Well, I have to be honest, none of my expectations were met. Uh, I predicted that the SC would win by 10 or more. And in the first quarter, I was feeling pretty good about that. And um, and then the wheels came off the wagon and. Uh, 
I, I found the game extremely disappointing, incredibly disappointing. And in every phase of it, uh, from the tackling was atrocious. It was embarrassing. Okay. There were some plays that I think should have been made, some interceptions that, that could have turned it around. But my expectations going in and the way it ended up was just a complete breathtaking letdown. Uh, in fact, I had to prepare myself for when I felt the game was actually over so that I would just kind of calm myself down watching it because it was painful to watch. And I think my expectations that was, if I did have an expectation, I thought that SC had improved enough that they could hit with Utah and nothing could be further from the truth. They got physically manhandled for the most part. Not all the players, I would make that sure, not all the players, but a good many of them really got exposed. Mark, your expectation going into this one that was met. I'm going to keep this real short and sweet. Not one thing, not one expectation was met. Not one. I, for me, I thought Utah would be tough. I thought they would have an ab, a huge chip on their shoulder, the fact that they got no credit from beating USC the first time around, and that all the talk this week, like they, they hinted at it, all the talk this week, USC in the playoff, and Caleb Williams winning the Heisman, and this was just kind of a coronation thing. They all talked about it, Kyle Whitney, Whittingham too, and the postgame thing. I thought Utah would come out and play tough. I didn't think they'd win. I thought USC would would say something about that or have something to say um about that but but i didn't think this was a pushover utah team um again let's go to surprise because i i think we could we could fill that up uh with a ton of stuff greg your surprise from this one our, our fourth thing well i think i touched on a lot of the surprises but i was surprised that utah could score 24 straight points and sc doesn't score it was like almost as though one team said, we've got you by the throat and you know it. And what we did learn uh, was that once uh, Kyle Whittingham, who makes his living off of defense, he's a defensive coach, since that shark in the water and the blood was there with literally with Caleb Williams, uh, they put the heat on him like uh, uh 400 degrees and uh it was the right strategy and the and the and the Utah players were feeling it and I felt that SC was backing down it was almost like they I don't want to say they gave up I, I think they played hard but there was not the enthusiasm you saw in the first quarter it was like erosion and uh by the end there was there was they had nothing left I mean I won't go over the tackling but I think that was a good indication well, Utah went over the tackling. They they did that plenty. Uh, Mark, Mark, fifth, the fourth thing, your surprise uh, in this one, and I know you said nothing about your expectation. Everything everything was a surprise then, right? Yeah, it, my, the surprise for me is is that this team had so much on the line, and I'm just going to talk specific about the defense and to play as poor as um, the. To, to tackle had you know you had Eric Gentry back you had Shane Lee who was coming back healthier um and to see Alex Grinch group the safeties poor we as a that I, it surprised me a lot to see you know they they actually held to uh, his first catch and come to later in the, what, in the, in the first half. Um, I don't know. Just how poorly they played. They'd seen this offense before. And to come out like and look, look like they had in the in Yeah, my, my surprise is going to be, again, the, the defense, right? Like, <laughs> that's that's its own thing i'm gonna go on the offense and i think the wide receivers to me were interesting there were some big usc offensive plays in this one a lot of them came on sort of utah busted coverages and sort of some design stuff and that kind of thing didn't feel like a lot of real 
significant one-on-one wins by the wide receivers. There were some drops, you know, Taj Washington, we, we've come to expect such great things from him. And, and he had a key one on a third down backed up, backed up uh, in their own kind of end zone there. And for so long, like the numbers, Mark, we went over them kind of during the game. The numbers are are crazy. It was like 26 minutes of game action where USC's offense had 34, 35 total yards and 34 of them came on one play. One yard in the third quarter. I, I don't care if Caleb Williams is playing with one leg and throwing left-handed. You got to figure something out there. That That was the surprise for me. Just... Not so much that Utah had a few answers, but that they absolutely shut down the USC offense for half of this game. That, that to me, it, it was shocking to me to watch that kind of performance offensively. And again, even if Caleb Williams is hurt, there's got to be some design, some something that you can do to get something going. And it was like everyone started pressing when Caleb got hurt a little bit it was like everyone wanted to win the game on every play so you had guys taking their hands off the ball you had defenders just trying to strip the ball out from a guy where just tackle him I mean at at no point were some of these guys doing what they're coached to do and and you could tell that that was the case everyone seemed to be trying to win the game with one play and for a team that talks about kind of do your job make the play be in the right spot that was out of character. That felt really out of character uh, for this team. And it felt like it was it was trying to fix what was wrong when Caleb went down and, and got hurt. And guys were trying to step up, I think, a little bit too much. Again, my, my surprise um, for that one. Let's go to the fifth thing now. We'll wrap this up and we'll go back to Greg. Fifth thing is the biggest takeaway for you from this game. Well, the takeaway was they had so many things that they could have accomplished in this game. Uh, They could have been the Pac-12 champions. They could have been in the playoffs. And those are two really big-time goals, and they get neither one of them. Uh, My takeaway was they finished the the regular season, if you include the the championship game, at 11-2. and Uh, which is great. I mean, the two losses were to the same team. So let's give them credit, Utah credit for doing it. Uh, You know, and they did it even better the second time around than the first time in their own, you know, their own in Rice Eccles Stadium. But to me, my takeaway is going to be, how is this team going to be able to respond for the bowl game? If they could win the bowl game, and I got a suspicion they're going to face probably somebody pretty decent, uh, and if they do, and they can finish up with a bowl game win, people will remember that as opposed to you lost your last two games. Now, we don't know whether Caleb Williams, what his his uh, you know status will be, but if it's going to be where he's not going to be able to perform well, at least they'll have enough practices with Miller Moss to uh, you know formulate some sort of game plan. But I think you have to not get so caught up. Right now, we're all caught up on the loss and what the loss cost them, but to take a look at the the season in its entirety and know they still have one more game to go and they they could maybe pull that one out. Uh, hopefully uh, Caleb is ready to play, but uh, I, I think that when we review this season, we'll say, you know what? They went way beyond in some ways what we thought they'd be. And uh, to sulk about two losses to Utah, okay, it happened but the season as a whole has still got a chance to end up on a, on a nice note. Mark, your biggest takeaway from this one. Yeah. You know, they, they finished the season 11 and two, not the way you want to, you want to finish the season. Um, But I, I, again, you, you want to appreciate everything they've done, but to see them, how, how successful they have been all, complete opposite in that final game um how they looked all year that's my takeaway it's it's how do you go from being so good like oh man we we weren't we weren't ready for the moment it's almost like what we were expecting at the beginning of the year 
finally showed up at the end of the season. So that's the takeaway. But the bottom line is they're 11 and two. That that's what's so tough about it, right? Like if you had told me game two, hey, the turnover luck isn't going to continue and the defense eventually is going to be so porous that they can't, you know, make up for this. Yeah, sure. That, of course that was going to happen, but it didn't and it didn't and it didn't and it didn't and it didn't. And then all of a sudden it does and, and that stuff. For me, I I made sure to go on the board actually this morning before the game just to get a thought out there ahead of the game. And I, I just posted... I said, look, win or lose, I think this season is a is a success. And, and I stand by that even after this. I think the way, Greg, you talked about sort of how do they bounce back and that thing. I think we know. I think this team, I think, I think the foundation for this program was built this year. And I think you had, you brought leaders in that are going to make, that made an impact this year and are going to make an impact for years to come. And I think ultimately, you look at this season as a success and not in an AYSO, everybody gets a trophy success. Like this game, this game was a bummer. This game was a disappointment. We talked about, everybody talked about that. The play, no, no chance are the players coming out of this one going, yeah, that was fine. We, you know, Hey, we should be happy. We're here. We're whatever. Lincoln rally did make a point to say we've come so far in a year like this is not this is not whatever that team was that lost to Cal at the end of last year that's not this team and I think you do have to have a takeaway from that to say these guys it, it's a good it's a good program the program is going the way I think you want it to go Greg I'm interested when you talk about the bowl game bowl games are so screwy now with who plays and who's motivated and you're going to get a team that that was a good team all year where 60 percent of their guys show up against a team that was okay but they've got a hundred percent of their guys and and so that's such a tough thing you know to kind of take into into account with um I think this team is is leaving this season once you can get beyond this game right go to sleep tonight and about four months <laughs> and and then kind of look back at this and say we came a long way in in the 2022 season and I think that's okay to do even coming off a loss but this one's going to take it's going to take a little bit I think for everybody to get over this one because again you thought you had some issues corrected oh they're tackling better they're better on the line of scrimmage against a Notre Dame team that we thought tested them a little bit and then it's not there and I go back to again the the surprise Felt like a lot of guys were trying to just do too much in this one and not just kind of doing their job. But we'll have one more uh, from this season. We'll wait to hear what bowl game USC lands in. But uh, for, for Greg Katz, for Mark Culkin, this is Eric McKinney. Come to you guys from a, a the end of a disappointing, again, like we mentioned, uh, Pac-12 championship game where Utah ends up winning 47-24 against USC. So that wraps it up. Five things from us. Thanks for watching Five Things. Thanks for watching We Are SC.